Welcome back to Pedestrian Bridge Design. This is part three of our three-part series. Once again, my name is Matt Yarnold, um, assistant professor at A&M. So we ended uh, the second part with um, all the roles um, and tasks for the design engineer. Um, but then the, the last piece, a really critical piece, is uh, the work of the contractor to actually build the facility. So um, this case study is actually a completed project, so I do have some nice uh, construction photos. And just to give you an idea of the uh, timeline, so um, as I talked about in the first part, the architect was involved around 2003, um, and then uh, the uh, contract with the engineering firm, which was uh, I was part of at Alman & Whitney, was done around uh, 2008 to 2010-ish. And then there was a little bit of a funding delay, but then um, it was uh, let for bidding and then uh, went under construction in 2013 and completed in January 2015. And this photo is just showing kind of them uh, breaking ground here. You could see them drilling some pretty large large uh, drilled shafts. In the prior video I talked about, that was the foundation type that was uh, utilized uh, partly from some of the locations we had some pretty tight uh, windows to fit our uh, substructures in, as well as we had some pretty, um, we needed some deeper foundations. The rock was pretty far down um, and uh, some pretty significant uh, you know, loads coming in uh, such a, a pretty long pedestrian bridge. So I don't have a lot of photos of the substructures. That's uh, one of the best ones I have, um, or as far as even the foundations and the substructures, you can see the, the piers there um, that were just constructed. And you can see the green coming up from the top is the epoxy coated reinforcement. So you can see here the epoxy coated reinforcement coming out of the top of the piers. And then of course you can see the crane is a lifting in place. And I talked about last video about how we went with this design uh, concept for kind of precast segments of the uh, of the ramp, about 35 foot span. Um, and uh, those were just then lifted and then set. You see in the next video, set, in this case, the very small kind of stub abutment in the background here. And you could see it's being uh, set on the uh, very, the shallowest uh, the pier. And um, you can see again, the rebar kind of sticking out. Some of them are bent up here, but it's rebar sticking out. And that's because you have ramps coming in on either side of that pier and then the rebar coming up from the top. And then there's, like I said last time, there's a nice closure pour that ties kind of everything together and makes a nice integral uh, ramp system. You can also see some of the architectural detailing just subtly. You can see some of the imprint here. There was a fluted shape and then there was some um, kind of textural uh, elements that were added. And then it's not the best quality image, but best I could find um, with uh, while they were building the stairway. Uh, so the Spanish stairs, if, if you will, is what they, the kind of the um, geometry that they were calling it. So this is midway up uh, the ramp and you can see the stairs um, being completed where we had a kind of a, a pier uh, midway and of course a, a, a sizable pier uh, handling the reaction from the uh, stairs and then of course from the ramp. So this is just showing another angle, but you can see in the background here, here's the stairs. And then of course you have um, a more sizable um, pier here supporting the ramp and the stairs. And of course you have a number of piers coming up all the way up to a much even more significant pier that's handling the ramp. It has a little bit bigger area for kind of a lookout platform. And then here's the bridge seat that will eventually handle the truss and the truss would be coming then towards us. That's a uh, um, general uh, layout there. And you can see it's under construction. You can see the, the timber there is just temporary you know, um, fall protection uh, for the workers. So now looking across to the other side, so now back at that pier looking, now this is the ramp system that's, par you know, right up against the uh, metro station, metro station way up here. And uh, you can see again, here's the, the piers for the, uh, that, that catch the other side of the truss. And then just again, uh, here being the, you know, CSX rail lines that we're trying to jump over top and you can see kind of the height of this thing. Cause again, we need a 23 foot, six inch full clear, uh, for the rail line, which necessitated, necessitated this, this, uh, you know, how tall of a structure we needed. And then of course, with the 80, re 80 requirements, um, dictated how long of a ramp we needed. And then eventually it ties back in with, uh, right into the lower level of the Metro station. So while the substructures were being, um, built and then the, the ramp was being constructed. The steel truss was being fabricated off site. 
Um, I had mentioned that we had some bolted field splices. So you could see the field splices right here in the different members. So the truss was set um, such that it was six main pieces. So you're looking at one third of the truss and you kind of have a top and a bottom uh, piece, if you will. So all the connections were welded with the exception of these bolted splices. Again, that was dictated by the owner. Um, so uh, those um, were logistically a little challenging when you're dealing with the tubes, uh, you know, the HSS sections, but we made uh, we had a nice kind of specs to, to show how to do that. And then you don't need um, as significant of a floor system for pedestrian bridges, but the owner still wanted a full composite deck. So you can see the shear studs here um, on the stringers. These are three stringers for the floor system. And we had some transverse floor beams. Um, so you can see the shear studs were done uh, by the fabricator. And then, you know, just uh, um, metal decking was put out um, in the field and then concrete, a thin concrete uh, deck was put on, on top of the structure. So that was prior to then erection. So here's some actual uh, completed Images. These were actually take a lot of those uh, prior construction photos were taken from the the website that was up uh, during uh, construction. But then when it was completed, I went out there and took some images. So you could see the ramp. Um, now, uh, right here, you could see here's the pedestrian trails. Now it's been it's been built, and um, and then the ramp. You could see here's that small stub abutment, and then all the the piers, obviously, and the kind of an ornate railing that was uh, chosen by the owner. And then here you could see kind of that. Um, a fluted stairway, if you will. So here's another shot of kind of showing the stairs. So you can either access it from this side, or you can go all the way to the end. Um, and uh, in the background here, you could see the uh, kind of this lookout platform, and then the truss. So now this is kind of a final product of the overall, you know, centerpiece, the big steel truss. Um, again, you can see the uh, the clearance here needed and why it's up um, so high, but we have our, you know, the same uh, kind of concept that the architect had in terms of this variable depth truss, you know, come to fruition and uh, also can see some other elements. You see a pretty sizable pier ended up being on either side. Um, that was really driven by some of the older criteria for wind. Um, we, we couldn't get them to back off on, on some of that, uh, but with this being pretty well enclosed with the paraglass, so you can see that paraglass line here, all this is um, protection for, uh, for the pedestrians, but yet still allowing for a, a nice aesthetic feature. Um, but having such a large projected area indicated some pretty significant lateral forces due to wind, which uh, drove up the uh, size of the pier. Um, and then you can see uh, some of the other um, you know, features of the structure from this view. And then the other piece, the other side of the ramp, so coming off that truss and paralleling the metro station. Again, paraglass was actually run all the way along the side. And you can see uh, here's the, the piers for the, uh, for the joining uh, truss bridge and the ramp. And then you see a number of other um, piers and then another small stub abutment at this end. And that's where the ramp makes a 90 degree turn and then enters the uh, metro station. So just to give you an idea what the... Um, user experience looks like. And if you go on YouTube and you type in Rhode Island Avenue pedestrian bridge, you'll see uh, actually a first person uh, video taken by a bicyclist of going through the entire facility. But you can see now um, the pedestrian uh, or the, sorry, the paraglass and how you can kind of, it gives you a nice view looking out over uh, the DC area. And on um, that, that meshing, there's just a very, the, the mesh actually is uh, less significant than say like a chain link fence, but it was all uh, another couple other details uh, other than just like the uh, railing, but the, the bridge itself, they selected uh, black uh, finish. And um, I think overall was a, a pretty successful um, project. So with any project, there are lessons learned or challenges. So I'll share um, the, these final thoughts. The uh, right-of-way restrictions and just the limited um, you know, space we had, and you could see that here. So this uh, right here, I'm showing, this is, I'm taking a photo from inside the lower level of the Metro station, um, a little bit further back than, uh, uh, than, I, than I showed you in the earlier video. But this, this narrow width where these uh, trees are and this kind of tough slope here was where we needed to land that ramp. So trying to figure out uh, the appropriate foundations and, and, and um, layout that would work, um, 
was uh, one of the bigger challenges of the project. So the other side was a lot of room, but here that was a lot of back and forth um, to, to make sure that that was going to be uh, feasible and not be, um, even if it is excessively expensive for the owner, to make sure we had the right uh, foundations and and, uh, and everything like that. And the tie-in was all going to be um, easy um, when it came to construction. The other thing was coordination with multiple stakeholders. I only talked about this very briefly in the earlier videos, but you know you have the owner of the the metro station, which was Wamada. You have uh, people in charge of the um, uh, the trail, other um, local organizations, um, the public weighing in. So trying to jockey all that uh, was a challenge, um, and uh, you know it, you have to sort of uh, balance everybody's interests in a, in a um, project like this. Uh, utility impacts I did mention, so there were several that we had to really be aware of. There's some significant lines that really couldn't relocate, or if we did, it would took a lot because they, some were powering the actual metro station or uh, CSX, and um, we really were trying real hard to, to adjust our alignment to make sure we didn't impact those, uh, util those underground utilities. And then the other thing I would say with the trust, um, for us, you know, the, it was all tube sections, HSS uh, sections, and the connection design we did sort of after the member design, thinking that that was logical and we would be able to adjust the welded connections accordingly. But the way it works is you actually sometimes have to adjust the members just to meet the connection requirements. So a lesson learned was not really waiting as long to do the connection design, um, kind of doing them uh, slightly earlier, I think is a, is a good lesson learned and saving some iterations we had to do with the, uh, the steel truss design. So with that, I'll close out the uh, three-part series on uh, pedestrian bridges. Thank you very much for your attention.